And we have one more panel discussion that looks at or rather that wants to give highlights or overviews of selected Horizon 2020 projects which support the um, Atlantic Ocean Research Alliance. And um, these projects specifically aim at understanding and sustainably managing the Atlantic Ocean as a whole through a large scale basin effort involving both the northern and the southern parts of this ocean and its interlinks with the adjacent areas. In order to achieve this, they bring together scientists, stakeholders, data, knowledge, expertise, capacities and resources through synergistic cooperation amongst the, among the bordering countries. And the activities of these projects contribute to upscale cooperation along and across the Atlantic Ocean and the creation of long-term partnerships such as the All Atlantic Ocean uh, Research Alliance. And to kick us off with the projects is Noel Chinleyside um, speaking on the Tri Atlas project. Over to you, Noel. Thank you, Tuli. Uh, Regina Rodriguez will be joining me. I'll just share the slides. Okay. Can you see my the presentation? I can, if you could put us on presentation mode. Does that look better? Perfect. So it's uh, wonderful to have this opportunity to introduce Triatlas. And as I've just said, Regina Rodriguez will actually take it from here. So I will just move to the next slide and then Regina can start. So, uh, <clears throat> hello, um, I'm Regina Rodriguez from the Federal University of Santa Catarina in Brazil, and I will present some of the goals of our project Triatlas, uh, Tropical and South Atlantic Climate-Based Marine Ecosystem Predictions for Sustainable Management. And uh, um, Noel will join me later on uh, from the University of Bergen in Norway. So, uh, as you probably know, Triatlas received funding from the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research Innovation Program. Uh, through the call BG8, or Atlantic Ocean Research uh, Alliance flagship. This is a fantastic initiative that enabled the implementation of the EU, Brazil, South Africa, Berlin statement on Atlantic Ocean Research and Innovation Cooperation. We are 33 partners from 13 countries, including Brazil, Senegal, Cape Verde, Benin, Ivory Coast, Angola, Namibia, South Africa, France, Germany, Norway, Spain and Ireland. Our ambition is to develop the understanding and build the capacity, observational, modeling and human to best predict the changes in marine ecosystem and its societal impacts, focusing in the tropical and South Atlantic. Um, this is an opportunity to mitigate the north-south power imbalance. As Vincent et al. 2020 say, uh, inequitable North-South partnerships are born out of a paradigm of knowledge deficit and capacity development that runs the risk of entrenched existing, existing inequalities. So creating a framework that enables the establishment of equitable partnerships requires a shift in perspectives on and process related to the design implementation and, and evaluation of success. And this is uh, a shift in, in, in perspective. And we show here as we illustrate, uh, 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 and this shift in perspective is, is illustrated here as we display the global map. The project has four core themes and three case studies. Uh, base scale Atlantic in the light uh, blue, uh, North Brazil, Northeast Brazil and Southern Benguela, dark blue circles. Next slide, please. Um, the first core theme focuses on all observations. In particular, the main gap we are trying to close is to collect physical, biogeochemical, and biological data to try to understand the biology of, uh, bi uh, biophysical interactions and impact on ecosystem and fisheries but ultimately to improve the obser observing system of the tropical and South Atlantic. In this sense, tri Triathlos has, a, uh, has an incredible value giving support for international programs such as predict, uh, prediction and research marine array in the tropical Atlantic, uh, known as PIRATA, 
program and South Atlantic Meridian Overturn Circulation Samba. They already fostered the relationship between European, African and American countries and the insertion of the tropical and South Atlantic in one single all Atlantic. These figures are illustrate one of, a, of the cruises already done last year and the diversity of the data collected. Next slide, please. The second core theme focuses on understanding the drivers of ecosystem change and variability. In other words, we investigate the role of physical drivers such as modes of climate variability and extreme events, as well as the human drivers such as overfishing. In particular, one of our main goals is to study marine heat waves for our three case studies. This figure is illustrates a marine heat wave in the tropical Atlantic that lasts almost all Austral summer last year with their impacts. We want to understand not only their impact on ecosystem, but also predict them, which leads to the next core theme. And now I pass the floor to Noel Kimsai, our PI. Uh, Noel, we can't hear you, you're muted. Thank you very much. So I was just thanking Regina for giving such a nice introduction to the project and to, the, to those two core themes. So I'd like to take up the, the next part or the next exciting aspect of Triatlas, which is prediction. And it's in the project we're developing the first ever numerical prediction system for climate and marine ecosystems. So there's a schematic here on the left. The current approach basically to predicting uh, climate and marine ecosystems is to do it separately. We run the climate model separately and then we uh, we integrate outputs from these ecosystem models separately and there's very little interaction between them. So our aim in Triatlas is basically to, to develop an integrated system in which we can predict the changes on from seasons to years in advance. So basically we're aiming to build a digital capability to provide unique tool for understanding confidence and ability and an ability to predict future changes in the marine ecosystems as an aid to managers. So we focus on those three regions and the, being the, the, the the whole of the Atlantic and there's a uh, southeast and Brazil and the uh, northeast and Brazil, sorry, and the southeast and Venezuela region. And we have three different Earth system models and three different ecosystem models that we are combining within the project. So the next thing that we're doing is uh, in uh, is to empower or empowering. We are training a new generation of researchers and providing new tools and technology. So a key a key component here is the CANEMS, is the Cross-Atlantic Network of Excellence in Marine Science. So within this program, we are training a new generation of interdisciplinary researchers. We are developing regional master's programs, highlighted the one in Benin, a co tutelar degrees. We had summer schools. It's obviously very difficult at this stage to have summer schools, but we were fortunate enough to have one in uh, January, actually in Cape Town, which you can see a, a picture there of. We have had onboard training and we are aiming to have research days. Again, that has been a little bit difficult. Another thing that I'd like to highlight here is the a fisheries app that has been developed by colleagues in Brazil. And uh, it's a, a, a very nice tool for collecting data using a, a, a mobile phone. And this is a, will enable a, a wide range of data to be collected from uh, local fisheries, fisheries communities. So we're building an all Atlantic climate and marine ecosystem research community for Triatlas. So it goes well beyond what uh, the, 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 the Triatlas team itself. So we, for example, we ha held a, a, again, unfortunately it was online, but it actually, the online format allows for a lot more participation. And so the Triatlas General Assembly was held in a conjunction with the Tropical Atlantic Variability and Pirata International Programs. So you've heard already about Parata being this observational network in the tropical Atlantic, more to raise. So we had more than 157 registrants from Africa, Asia, Europe, North and, and South America. There was the, the presentations included many from outside of the project. So we had eight oral presentations, six of those were the, from tropical Atlantic variability community. We had 60 poster presentations in parallel sessions and uh, 15 of those were from outside of the, the triatlas community. So we're really aiming to build a, uh, an international program or network in, in research on climate and marine ecosystems across the whole of the Atlantic. 
And with that, I'd like to thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Regina and, and Noel. Um, great research outputs uh, there and clearly evidence that you're building the community you're talking about um, and you're building it from different levels as well, which is, which is really cool. If we had a bit of time and if we were going to ask questions, I was going to ask Regina about overfishing and what impact it has on the local person and what impact it has on uh, you know the 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 jobs and uh, and, and security of, of food in the home as opposed to uh, externally I, I would be very interested to to hear that uh, because we do have a little bit of time in just just a minute if we go over a minute Regina I will get into trouble my bosses are also watching <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's a combine uh, of overfishing and actually the climate change. We see that these extreme events of, uh, of a temperature, for instance, has actually have a huge impact here where I live, which is an island in the southern part of Brazil. Uh, you know, interrupted, I mean, uh, decimated some, some species of clam and also interfered with aquaculture of oysters. So it has a huge impact on, mm -hmm. on, on uh, and we, we would like to have to see more conservation um, policies I here. I, I, I understand. I understand your, your response, Regina. Uh, perhaps asking it differently, I, I want to know how it impacts the fishermen. Yes, exactly. Yeah, uh -huh. exactly that. We have a, 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 a small fisherman, a thousand fishermen, and they are all out of a job with it, you know, and oh, it's I really see. difficult, yeah. I see, and it's not because of overfishing. It's because of the quality now of the it's of a, the. Mm -hmm. It's a combined. It's a combined effect of the overfishing, mm -hmm. as well the climate uh, pressure or, or this is extremes, for instance, yeah. you know, and pollution all together uh, on yeah. on the stocks and then uh, and the livelihoods and they migrate a little bit. To, some can actually migrate for tourism. Instead, mm -hmm. I've seen this here happening. But, but not all of them can can do that. Thank you. So that is Thank you. really. Thank you. Thank you so much to both you, um, Regina and, and Noel. Great uh, work there in that project. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we will go to the I Atlantic with uh, Murray Roberts and AJ Smith. Thank you very much. My name is Murray Roberts and it's a great pleasure to represent today the I Atlantic project. I'll be doing this with uh, AJ Schmidt, who is the Southeast Atlantic uh, Regional Coordinator for our project. I Atlantic is an integrated assessment of Atlantic marine ecosystems in space and time. And we're a project that focuses on the deep and open ocean. We're also a project that embraces the old Atlantic approach. We work from the north, uh, north of Iceland, in fact, all the way to the south, the southern tips of Africa and South America. We work from Europe across to Canada and the United States and down through the uh, shores of, of Brazil uh, and, uh, and Western Africa. So we have an ambitious agenda ahead of us and I want to try to summarize our work uh, in the next few minutes together. One of the foundations for our project and for our plan was actually recognizing the really significant imbalances that we've heard about throughout today. To me, this graphic from IOC UNESCO's 2017 Global Ocean Science Report is one of the most shocking graphics that I think I've ever come across. These are cartograms where the globe, the world, the maps of the world are distorted by at the top the number of citations received in marine sciences. So this is a very, very unfair and a very, very bad situation. And this is one of the reasons that in Atlantic and in our sister projects like Triatlas, we've created networks of early career researchers. We're investing a lot of uh, resource, a lot of energy in our early young people. Uh, we put them at the front of our agendas uh, and we're very, very proud of the work they do. Please, everyone on this call, do follow our fellows in Atlantic. We run webinars that the fellows themselves organize and have opened to the whole world. As we heard from Noel, 
in the online world, people are very engaged uh, and joining in huge numbers. So please do follow our fellows, look at our website for any details on that. iAtlantic is a big project, it's a big consortium. I clearly can't summarize all of the partners in our project, but we draw our partnership from the right around the Atlantic Basin. The budget is just a shade over 10 million euros. There are 35 beneficiaries of that budget, but there's a wider partnership, a growing partnership of uh, other associated partners. And we're excited to be developing an MOU at the moment with the Benguela Current Commission. So what is it we're actually doing in iAtlantic? I can't summarize in, in three or four minutes all of the aspects of our project, but I can give you a sense of our objectives. So in iAtlantic, we aim to standardize ocean observing in the north and south to establish short, medium, and long-term assessments of ocean circulation. To put some flesh on those bones, we work closely with our other projects. Working with Triatlas, we've enhanced the capacities of the Samba array by buying instrumentation, deploying it. The physical oceanographers in our two projects working very closely together to make the best of those investments. That's a big part, that's a foundational aspect of our work. We're working to map deep ocean ecosystems. Think here of the multi-beam bathymetry of the seafloor, this emerging technology. We're applying autonomous systems to that question. We're working at whole basin scales, regional and local scales. It's a big part of iAtlantic. The core of our ecosystem assessments are assessing stability, vulnerability, and tipping points in, re in relation to a whole variety of stressors. That scientific Evidence base then moves into work to build and enhance human and technological capacities and to work with industry, regulator, and government stakeholders. We work with some very large industries, including the offshore sector, and we work with a number of smaller industries as well. And we have a working group uh, focused on local and indigenous knowledge in the Atlantic project. All of the details are on our website. The places in the Atlantic that we work are shown on, on this slide. We have 12 study areas crossing the whole breadth of the Atlantic, north to south, east to west. The many lines that cross that map illustrate in black the ocean observing arrays of instrumentation like the Samba array in the South Atlantic, the OSNAP and rapid arrays in the North Atlantic. The little flecks that you can see almost like a snowstorm across the map are the Argo floats we heard about from Craig McLean. We work intensely with the data sets derived from Argo. In red on that uh, map, you can see some of the flagship expeditions of iAtlantic. Some of these are curtailed by the COVID pandemic and we're working very hard to replan and reorganize our objectives in light of those changes. The team uh, responsible for leading iAtlantic, I gratefully acknowledge, you can see everybody's pictures on the slide. There's a tremendous group there with regional coordination in each corner uh, of the Atlantic Basin. I now want to move um, to my co-presenter, AJ Schmidt from the University of Western Cape. And AJ is gonna bring uh, a little bit of light and color to some of the work that's going on in the Southeast Atlantic. So AJ, I'll pass the slide to you. Thank you, Murray. Um, yeah, uh, Murray gave a, 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 a beautiful overview of the, the, the broad, the high level um, details of, of iAtlantic. And I, I would like to use this opportunity to, to um, take a view from the Southeast Atlantic, from Cape Town side, and to uh, give a small overview about one of the objectives that we are particularly involved in and participating in and add value to, to, to the iAtlantic program. Earlier in the Triatlas uh, talk, we heard um, some mention of marine heatwaves. Marine heatwaves is something that here in South Africa we're particularly interested in uh, for several reasons. Um, one of the reasons is that it, the, the Atlantic Ocean is very strongly connected to the Indian Ocean and um, pulses of hot water spin off via Gullis Current and enter the Southeast Atlantic portion of of the, of the Atlantic Ocean. So we would like to use um, um, the marine heat wave analysis to shed some light into the dynamics of how the hot water move into the Southeast Atlantic Ocean. Um, so that's a, a new application of, of marine heat waves. We know a lot about marine heat waves in shallow water ecosystems, but in I Atlantic, we'd like to use it to add additional views into oceanographic processes. But we would also like to use the um, marine heat wave algorithm coupled with some of the cutting edge ocean models in both hindcast and forecast uh, modes to understand how hot water behaves or 
things that can be seen as marine heat waves behave in the ocean interior as well as in on the benthos. So to that end, we would like to do an entire marine heat wave analysis over about 50 years uh, back in time, uh, 50 years forward in time, and understand how pulses of hot water behave um, associated with the ocean floor, and particularly use this to come up with maps of um, uh, risk and vulnerability to understand how the very sensitive deep water biota could respond to um, pulses of hot water. So that is one of the views that here from the, from the southern side of the Atlantic, um, we would like to offer um, uh, in, in our contributions towards the um, entire uh, I Atlantic program. Thank you, Murray. Thank you so much, AJ. And just to move to our final slide from I Atlantic, to summarize for you the expected impacts and ambitions of the project, I won't run through Bellem. We're huge fans of the Bellem statement and the bringing together of partnerships. Um, we will be improving monitoring and assessments, developing ecosystem assessments. Then if you look at the center of our list of ambitions, it's really to implement and to work directly with policy. We want to take our scientific findings and without any hesitation or delay, move direct to policy fora. And we do that. We have track record in the North Atlantic Galway process of doing that. We're very keen to enhance. I will stop in one uh, second just to flag a couple of things I think would be of interest to the wider community. I Atlantic is spearheading with our sister projects a Geos Atlantic community site. If you're interested in that in terms of data sharing and pooling of Atlantic data, please be in touch with us. And we're very interested and actively engaged through our advisory boards and other routes in the UN decade. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much for that presentation to you, uh, both Marianne and AJ Smith. And, and, and again, I revert back to, to being a virologist and, and sitting here and thinking about uh, how informative all of this is and how incredible the research that is being done is, you know, and I'm sitting here and I'm thinking to myself, um, how does the map, when we have the map, how does it assist the lay person? And at what point do we incorporate the lay person into the research that we do and into our research communities? Is there a move very quickly, is there a move to incorporate um, the lay person, the community into the research, and if so, how? Yes, 100%. At the end of the day, I Atlantic will all be about the maps that we produce, the maps that will highlight those areas of the Atlantic that are changing the most rapidly, within which we have ecosystems showing signs of tipping from one state to another, as AJ uh, was explaining. And we're bringing people with that at every stage. So we're working intensely with filmmakers and with educators and with others to do that work. We're actually using lessons learned in the North Atlantic in that process. We're even developing uh, planetaria visualizations of the Atlantic to show people the Atlantic almost in a three-dimensional sense in public um, planetariums. And we want to do that with partners in Brazil uh, and, and across Europe and South Africa as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mary and AJ Smith for that presentation. I think uh, it's become my, my job. I, I've sort of made it my job to try and understand how our science intersects and interfaces with the people. Um, the next uh, project that we're going to uh, hear from is Equa Vitae. Um, and there we have Philip James and Cliff Jones. Uh, thank you, uh, Talila. I will just uh, be myself presenting today. Can you see my screen? I can. It's 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 not in presentation mode. However, thank you. And now, great. All right. Well, thank you very much, and thank you to the organisers of the All Atlantic Ocean Research Forum for the uh, um, uh, uh, possibility of presenting Aquavita here today. My name is Phil James. I come from. Uh, well, I work at an institute called Nofema, which is based in the north of Norway in Tromsø, well inside. <clears throat> The Arctic Circle. So wherever you are, you're probably a bit warmer than where we are today. But it's very nice to uh, to be a part of this um, webinar. I'm going to present Aquavitae, which is a, a relatively large project. We have 35 partners from 16 different countries. And the main aim of Aquavitae is to unlock the potential of sustainable, low trophic aquaculture in the Atlantic. I'm just going to take a step back. One of the first um, recorded events of aquaculture in Europe was back in 1235 AD, and that was the culture of blue mussels in France. 
if we um, go forward from there, uh, there's been this move towards intensive monoculture aquaculture. Um, what I mean by that is uh, very large farms, very intense, high biomass of animals, and normally just one species. Um, a good example, I think, is the intensive high-tech salmon farming that we see in Norway today. Um, salmon, of course, being a relatively high trophic level species. In the last five to 10 years, we've seen this um, paradigm shift where we've got a number of reports from both the EU uh, and from the United Nations. We also see now the Green Deal and the Farm to Fork strategies from the EU. And all of those um, reports and strategies suggest that we should move back towards uh, not, not, not producing fish, but also producing low trophic species. Um, the reasons are that they are extractive species. Uh, we can produce a lot of food by producing low trophic species. And we don't need to add food to the oceans and pollutants to the oceans in order to grow those species. And good examples are macroalgae. There's been a real push towards macroalgae and mussels, the original um, species that was farmed in Europe. And projects like Aquavitae and Astral that you'll hear about in a moment are both looking um, both at low trophic species and also integrating a number of different species in the same farm, which is quite a different philosophy from what we've had up till now. The five value chains that we look at specifically in Aquavitae are macroalgae, integrated multi-trophic aquaculture, echinoderms, shellfish and finfish, and those activities are taking place uh, in all the main continents uh, of the Atlantic, so North and South America, of course Europe, and um, Africa as well. We have 11 uh, specific case studies uh, from these five value chains. They're all color coded there. You can see where they relate. In terms of IMTA, we have <clears throat> three case studies, sea-based, land-based, and bioflock. We're also looking at producing sea urchins and sea cucumbers, uh, new species of macroalgae and uh, pond culture on land, and offshore cultivation of brown kelp as well. Looking at different um, aspects of mussel and oyster aquaculture, and also both freshwater and marine species of finfish in Brazil. We have a couple of cross-cutting uh, case studies as well. One of those is utilizing the byproduct from, from the mussel industry, specifically the shells as an example. And the other one is using low trophic species as feed for high trophic species, such as the Brazilian flounder. And what are the outputs from these case studies? <clears throat> We've divided them into three stages. We've got the hatchery stage, the post hatchery and grow out stage and the post harvest stage. 18 new processes and products from the first of those, 48 processes and products from the second and 43 new products um, from the post harvest stage. In total, 109 new low trophic products and processes coming from Aquavitae in the life. Uh, of the project and I should have mentioned at the beginning we're at month 18 of the project um, at the moment. All of these um, are contributing to unlocking the potential of sustainable aquaculture and we use that word sustainable it's a big word um, I think we need to have an understanding of what that is so alongside the more practical case studies we have a series of work packages um, one of them is looking at what uh, sustainable low trophic aquaculture actually really means they've produced an excellent report um, it's published two or three months ago, where they defined what the desired state was. Uh, they linked it back to the prioritized uh, sustainable development goals and created the very substantial list of sustainability indicators to allow us to monitor where we are now, what we need to monitor in order to what uh, uh, what we need to monitor in order to get to our desired state, and how we monitor whether or not we we stay in that state. And they produced this excellent diagram as part of the report. Um, <clears throat> showing the four main pillars of sustainability. And it's very clear that unless we address uh, economic issues, environmental, social, and governance uh, issues around low trophic aquaculture, then it's never gonna be viable. So it's, I really like this uh, diagram. I think it makes it very clear the broad aspects that we need to cover uh, in a project like Aquavitae. It's not just about biology, it's not just about economics or social um, uh, aspects. And, in this diagram, they link back to the sustainable de development goals and give an excellent summary of those four pillars. I mentioned policy and governance because for a relatively new industry like um, low trophic aquaculture, uh, we really need 
uh, strong uh, and reliable policy and governance. So again, in another work package, we've been running um, a review of the legislation on algae, uh, aquaculture and IMTA in the countries that you see on the map there to the left. And in association with that, a series of workshops, again, run right around the Atlantic, looking again at uh, both macroalgae and IMTA in terms of stakeholder perception, where they see the bottlenecks and where they see the needs of the future. Uh, we have a, 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 a large and growing multi-stakeholder platform. Remembering this is at month 18 of the project. Um, at the moment, we have 165 stakeholder organizations ranging from the case study level right up to the much broader uh, policy type Atlantic level. In terms of communication and dissemination, uh, so far we've reached an audience of 2.2 million uh, across 150 activities. And what's really pleasing and interesting is that the countries that are really driving those numbers are Brazil, Norway, South Africa, and Spain. So it's really, really very pleasing to see both Brazil in South Africa in there and just show what a huge contribution they're making um, to the project. Uh, a point, uh, Siggy actually made this point in a meeting, um, I can't remember when the meeting was, but she pointed out that it's relatively easy to convince somebody like this whose life uh, um, depends on the health of the ocean, how important projects like Aquavitae and other all Atlantic projects are, much more important, uh, or sorry, much more difficult uh, to get to and convince all sectors of society. For instance, the example that Siggy used was the Austrian taxi driver. And that's that's the challenge that we face um, in all of these projects, I guess. And it's been discussed many times earlier in the day. We do have consumer perception and attitude work package as well, which are looking at how uh, members of society perceive low trophic aquaculture uh, and what their attitudes towards it are. And finally, um, as in many of the other projects, the youth of today we see as a really big part of Aquavitae's legacy for tomorrow. These are some of the uh, masters, PhDs and postdoc students we have working in Aquavitae. We're very proud of them all. Uh, this is our first student exchange, which COVID uh, allowing uh, will happen next year. This is Linnea, she's uh, traveling from the USA to study in Sweden. And inspired by the Follow the Fellows, um, which I thought was a really fantastic um, concept. We've now kicked off our low traffic life webinar and Stephanie here from University of Sao Paulo was our first speaker last week and that went extremely well and we look forward to hearing. These are the people that will inherit the aquaculture industry in the future, will drive policy. Uh, so absolutely crucial in our project as they are um, across all the projects. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you for the opportunity to present Aquavitae. Please come and visit our website if you want any information or contact one of the um, partners. And if you can, remember, please eat more low trophic uh, seafood. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, uh, Philip. I happen to love oysters. Uh, as it were, so I will continue to do so as per your recommendation. Um, you 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 speak about the the future policymakers and so on, and I and 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 I like that because as uh, PhD and master students, we're never really conscientized to the uh, policy components of the work and the research that we do and the social impacts of the work that we do. And it's and if it, if it is, it's very theoretical. And I'm hoping that. Uh, this uh, building of this pipeline and this conscious uh, youth that you speak of will also be very aware of the political or the policy side of the research that they do. Thank you very much, Philip, for your uh, presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Um, we move on now to Astral, um, and that is presented by Elisa uh, Ra. Elisa Revignan and Thomas Chalde, Child, Chalde. I'm struggling uh, with these here names. Um, hello, good morning and uh, good afternoon. Just a moment uh, there display setting is a little bit fuzzy. Can you see the presentation mode? We, no, it's not on presentation mode yet. Now it's on presentation mode, thank you. Perfect, thank you. So good morning and good afternoon. It's really very a pleasure to be here at the forum. 
And uh, um, I, me, uh, I'm Elisa Ravagnan from uh, NORS, the Norwegian Research Center up in Norway, a little bit south of, uh, than uh, Philip that just presented, but uh, still in uh, quite far north. And uh, my co-presenter would be Thomas, uh, Thomas Chalde from uh, the south of uh, uh, Argentina. So we, we almost uh, are from pole to pole today. So we are here to present you uh, um, another project awarded in the BG08 uh, uh, group in the Old Atlantic Ocean, that is Old Atlantic Ocean Sustainable and Profit Profitable and Resilient Aquaculture, Astral. And uh, uh, we are really very uh, pleased. Uh, we just started in uh, September. So unfortunately, we cannot present so striking results as the three projects that uh, were before us. But we are really very ambitious. And uh, uh, also, in collaboration with the project uh, uh, in uh, or the All Atlantic Ocean, we really will present uh, new results at the next forum. So only a few words about uh, the project overview. Uh, of course, Astral is, uh, uh, the overall uh, objective is to develop a new sustainable, profitable and resilient value chain for integrated multitrophic aquaculture. And as Philip was saying before, is the one you can grow different type of uh, species in the same area. So foster circularity and natural circularity. And of course, this will uh, uh, is for the whole uh, for Atlantic markets. And the Austral Consortium is multidisciplinary, of course, but also multisectoral. We have a research and technology organization, uh, academia, SMEs, association, cluster, cluster of industries, governmental and intergovernmental organizations. And uh, of course, the core of the project is the four IMTA labs, our case studies. And we focus on IMTA, but in different system. So beside having the classical uh, IMTA that is uh, open offshore, we also have the flu through inshore and recirculate inshore, the spread between Ireland, Scotland, South Africa, and Brazil. And also Argentina that we call our prospective IMTA lab, not, not being an IMTA lab, uh, an IMTA uh, system there, but wanted to learn from, uh, from and this, um, uh, exchange experience with uh, other areas and system to decide the best uh, possibilities. And of course, all those uh, systems focus on a regional channel based perspective and uh, include different type of uh, chain and different type of species. And as you can see from, uh, from the map, we are uh, nicely spread around the, the Atlantic Ocean. As I say, the IMTA lab are uh, our uh, core of the project, of course. And uh, uh, now I will illustrate some of the plan and achievement. So what we would like to do is to, of course, improve the IMTA value chain with new species and also new novel species combination. That's really very important in an IMTA system. De developing operation welfare indices, so for health management, assessing the risk pathogens and infections for the biosecurity, and suggest the best practice in this uh, in overview of the knowledge transfer. But of course, all the production is really very important, but it's really very important uh, uh, to assess all the, um, all the level of sustainability. So, uh, so the ecological, the environmental, but also the social economical. So in, uh, in Astra, we will determine the best IMTA configura configuration to reduce the waste. So to achieve the zero waste, to assess the increase, the circularity, to develop business models, and also to improve the social license to operate. But of course, we are not uh, operating in a bubble. These systems uh, have, uh, is important to monitor what is happening in the production, but also the uh, impact and the interaction from and to the environment. So Astral will develop an innovative technological pool, not only exactly to monitor the production, but also to monitor some external stressors that we have identified as uh, the harmful algal bloom the pathogens and microplastic, and of course, the effect of climate change on this type of production. But as we say, we have heard today uh, in the 
uh, in basically all the presentation to go together is going beyond the capability of the single. So the collaboration is extremely important in astrology, not only with the other projects and the community of researchers, but also with the stakeholders. And when I'm saying stakeholders, I'm talking about all the stakeholders. So not only industry, but policymaker, um, education and everybody and citizens, everybody together. So Astral is developing a stakeholder platform that we call, can call that is the aquaculture helix and also implementing a collaborative ecosystem through the Atlantic Aquaculture Alliance or 3A to foster stable co collaboration between stakeholders. And of course, to increase the professional skills and competence so with dedicated training programs. I have to mention that, of course, I totally agree with, uh, with all the other projects that the students are really very important, but we think also to, uh, we um, have the ambition to work also with the lower, the lower grade students, with the children at the primary school, because they are the next, next generation, and it's really very important to start to educate them now to, um, to a new future. And now I can leave uh, Thomas. Yes, thanks, Elisa. Uh, in Astral, we expect, as Elisa said, to, to contribute uh, to Glenn's statement. And we have an ambitious plan to reach an all Atlantic research community, connecting science, producers, community, policymakers, and any other relevant stakeholders related to aquaculture production. Um, we will promote exchange of data, the exchange of knowledge and generate business opportunities. And all these interactions will be focused on reaching agreements in order to know which is the best way to develop sustainable aquaculture across all these uh, Atlantic countries that's, that uh, Elisa mentioned before. Uh, we also expect to increase competitiveness in blue economy and promote leadership in ocean technology development, not only to support aquaculture production, but also, and very important, to improve monitoring of environmental risk of this activity. Um, to do that, we will develop an ambitious plan of training workforce in blue economy, and of course in aquaculture through a human capital plan connecting the experiences of several Atlantic countries. Uh, next. Please, Elisa. And one of the most important impacts uh, of these projects will be the development of new production systems in aquaculture, specifically integrated multi-trophic aquaculture system, following the sustainable, resilient, and profitable food production. And last, uh, another critical impact we expect from Astral is to increase consumers' trust and confidence in seafood products uh, we, we will explore social license and social acceptability on these products. And to do that, we will develop a, a transparency working plan and making a great effort for disseminating all the, the activities that we, we are going to, to do in, in, in this project. Elisa, if you have a finished word. Yeah. No, thank you. Please follow our social media, follow the project, and uh, we are really very happy to be uh, to have entered the community and to be able to collaborate with the other project and the community at large in the uh, Atlantic Ocean. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to you both, uh, Elisa and, and 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 Thomas. And I think by now I'm quite predictable. Uh, I'm sure, and, and and I want to just say thank you for, for, for starting at primary school level and building that pipeline uh, from the bottom um, up because what becomes a problem is changing the mindset of a person who's been doing something in a particular way for a very long time. So if we start when they're younger and they are agile and they're malleable to listening to what it is we are wanting to, to um, say to them for the betterment of society, I think it's a great place to to start. Thank you to you both. And uh, I move on now to the project, the Mission Atlantic. Uh, and our presenter there is Patrizio Mariani. Exactly. 
<laughs> if I can get the presentation. Sure. I hope that you can see my screen in the presenter mode. Yes, perfect. Thank you. So um, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to present Mission Atlantic, a project that uh, just started. Uh, we are at month three. Uh, we did the gig off in October. So we are one of the new one on the stage here. And uh, the main motivation to start Mission Atlantic, which is actually a quite ambitious program, uh, which will run from 2020 to 2025, uh, was the idea of uh, um, transformative changes. Uh, transformative changes mean that um, uh, the, the way we will look uh, at the method we use for ocean management in 2030, and we look back at 2020 and we say, okay, these methods are out of date. We want to make new one. We have ideas for making new methods for uh, uh, integrated ecosystem assessment, mainly in coastal areas, but we will show you also some open ocean case studies that we have. And we think that the, the, the period is just right because we have these international uh, initiatives like the Sustainable Development Goals, but also the Decade of Ocean Science that can really create the momentum for, for these uh, transformative changes. Uh, we also start to realize that uh, the, some of the stressors we have in the Atlantic, they are across scales. Uh, some of them, they are uh, regional. For example, here is the, the Sargassum bloom uh, a few years back. Uh, some of them are very local, but devastating. And this is the picture from the oil spill last August uh, in Brazil. Uh, some of them are global, and uh, we heard about these uh, marine heat waves and the strong impacts that they have on ecosystem, bringing them to the edge of a tipping point or maybe crossing tipping point. And these tipping points, they are not in isolation, they will act together, most likely. So we need new methods and we need to develop them. Um, there is a very good initiative from the World Economic Forum about these uh, transformative changes and what it implies in terms of uh, uh, cross sectors that are affected by them. And if you look and look at them at the ocean, I mean, there are things like governance, things like food security, things like artificial intelligence, or teams that actually we will touch upon in Mission Atlantic, realizing uh, mainly that uh, uh, the sustainable development goals, they're not all the same. Some of them are ecological ones. And if we fail to uh, reach, achieve these goals, all the others actually will be difficult to achieve. So we need to focus also on issues that are not uh, specific for a single state, but actually uh, that uh, involves more uh, than one country and not a single country can face. That were the main motivation of Mission Atlantic. How we do that? Uh, we think that uh, we'll use this uh, integrated uh, marine ecosystem assessment approach, uh, which is a framework that is well established in the literature. We will apply it uh, in an operational sense across different case studies in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, so Mission Atlantic will develop and systematically apply integrated ecosystem assessment, which basically implies that uh, uh, we will uh, identify the ecosystem components that are more at uh, most at risk for natural hazards and consequences of uh, human activities. And we will use all the information available out there in terms of time series, in terms of data collected. We will work together with the projects uh, that have been there uh, and they have already data collected. They have already knowledge that is developed. We will build upon that with them. Uh, the, the structure of the project is around basically the, the, the scoping idea. So understanding at the local regional level, uh, what are the main problems uh, for the management? So what is the problem that we have to answer or to address? We will develop specific indicators for ecosystem state. So to understand if the problem uh, is going one direction or the other direction, are we in a critical uh, conditions where maybe a tipping point is uh, um, it's close by uh, to be crossed? We will perform risk analysis. Once we have this picture of indicators and understanding of them across different scales, uh, what is the risk of one of these uh, uh, indicator to fail, uh, to stay in, uh, in a good environmental status, but to cross the line and go into regions that we don't know? We will also make scenarios. So not only the situation as it is now, but how it will look in the future. And we will make a synthesis uh, across all the case studies at the, at the Atlantic Basin scale. And we don't do this in isolation. We do this always together with the society. So in, uh, as we speak, we have already uh, case study leaders that are involving the society and stakeholders to discuss about problems in the region, to identify maybe initial indicators for that. And we will 
keep this process ongoing in terms of uh, validation of the indicators with them, validation of the results that we get, and also understanding of the models and the problems and if this analysis actually uh, helps them in their daily life. So that's basically in a nutshell, Mission Atlantic. I want to spend a few words about the tools that we will develop because some of them, they are not only focusing on the Atlantic. Actually, most of the modeling that we will do, they are, it's global. Uh, we will have global ocean models at uh, uh, relatively high resolution, but across all the trophic levels. So from the bacteria to the uh, plankton and fish, sorry for my phone ringing. And uh, we will also have the fish uh, population uh, performed in these models. And we will have these four climate scenarios. And um, going from 1980 to 2050. The case studies are mapped here in this uh, dark uh, green or brown almost. Uh, these are the, uh, the one directly addressed in uh, Mission Atlantic. Some of these uh, lines are some of the uh, seagoing activities that we will have. I want to stress the fact that we will use new, new type of uh, technologies uh, like uh, wave gliders with a payload that is quite specific uh, uh, in terms of acoustic collections, uh, acoustic data collection. This is um, first time probably that this, uh, this, um, uh, this type of payload is mounted on a wave glider for such a long distance because we will go from the Azores to the Ascension Island and then from Ascension Island to the South Brazilian Shelf, touching upon the Cabo Frio and also the beautiful island of Florianopolis that was uh, introduced before. Uh, but we will have other activities. We will have in Santa Elena divers going and collecting uh, benthic communities. We will have a dedicated uh, flagship crews in Brazil uh, together with the Ministry of Defense there. We have a lot of uh, activities and we would like to open it up to all the partners in the All Atlantic Research Alliance here. So if you are interested, please contact us. One of the main, one of the main goal actually is to make these uh, social ecological uh, networks or social ecological graphs. So understanding how the human activities, what are the stressors that they produce or the pressures and how these pressures are affecting the different ecosystem components. Uh, to do that, we also have ideas in terms of a new type of artificial neural network to be developed on the data that we will produce in the model and identify maybe new type of indicators. Uh, we will also have ensemble modeling. So running several type of models, uh, also including management strategy evaluation models and try to produce an envelope. Uh, and that envelope could be the safe operating space where the human activities can be safely developed. And uh, that's basically what uh, Mission Atlantic is. And of course, uh, here is some context because we are new on the stage. We are still waiting for the website. Probably we will launch it in a few days, uh, mid of December, most likely. It's a huge partnership and uh, uh, very enthusiastic uh, partners, I have to say, from uh, South Africa, Sambi was presented before, and the University of Cape Town uh, from Brazil. Uh, we have uh, uh, University of Florianopolis, the University of Sao Paulo. I think what slide was missing about the capacity building, uh, and I'm sorry for that because we also have a strong partnership with the World Maritime University, uh, where we are launching uh, for this year as a pilot, um, some uh, fellowship related to integrated ecosystem assessment that is directly integrated in the Master of uh, Sustainable Ocean uh, Governance and uh, Management. So Thank you. Uh, please reach us out and uh, we will give you more information about all these initiatives. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Patrizio, for sharing your very in-depth plan um, with us. Um, and I see that uh, some of the speakers that have been here, some of your uh, collaborators, and they are saying they look forward to working with you. Uh, and they look forward to the collaboration, uh, Patrizio. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that. And I will move on now to Atlantico, Atlantico with Danielle Ludicone and Kelly Goodwin. Yes, hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning, good evening. I will have uh, Kelly introducing the first part because this is uh, going to be a duo with uh, presenting first the Our uh, Microbiome Initiative and then uh, the Atlantico project. So Kelly, are you there? Thanks, you can go to the next slide. Uh, Kelly Goodwin from NOAA, US. They do, you put it in presentation mode, I think. Sorry. Great, thank you. 
The Atlantic Ocean Research Alliance Marine Microbiome Roadmap was released in February 2020, which I know feels like a universe ago, last time we met. Um, and in recognition of the importance of the marine microbiome to understand and sustain ocean ecosystems and the benefits they provide to society. The marine microbiome is at the heart of the living ocean. Although viruses, bacteria, phytoplankton, etc., are tiny, they hold large benefits. Microbiomes are the foundation of food webs and critical biogeochemical cycles, including those involved in climate regulation. This hidden treasure is being revealed through advances in omics technologies. Benefits include a largely untapped resource in terms of biodiscovery, the bioeconomy, and development of a sustainable food supply, which we heard a little bit about from the Aquavita uh, program. Combining the strengths of government, academia, and industry and aligning objectives and incentives will help advance microbiome research and mature its application across sectors. The vision of the Marine Microbiome Roadmap is to spark fascination and to demonstrate the socioeconomic value of the Atlantic's marine microbiome. The roadmap is organized along three pillars and a set of cross-cutting challenges. Next slide, please. Cross-cutting actions include shared and cooperative practices, leverage infrastructure and research and development that is ethical and fair. The environment and climate pillar lays out actions to map, characterize, and to parameterize microbiomes, which allows ecosystem understanding to be modeled and turned into predictions or forecasts. Understanding can be transitioned into solutions with examples such as pollution cleanup or carbon uptake. The Atlantico project will help implement the marine microbiome roadmap, and my partner Daniele will give you a brief overview of Atlantico. Thank you very much, Kelly. So yes, so the Atlantico project, I'm uh, Daniele Ludicone, coordinator of uh, this uh, new age 2020 project that is supposed to implement the Belem statement and to contribute to implement. Uh, it's uh, entirely dedicated to the microbiome. So the aim of this uh, project composed by 36 partners uh, from Europe, uh, Brazil and South Africa is to have a novel policy framework uh, to manage the ecosystem health and services by introducing new tools like genomics and optic uh, um, optic data to approaches to, to the monitoring environment. It's also to engage with science, industry, policy, and citizen and build the shared capacity. So we occupy a sort of niche in the project landscapes because we are really going to focus on microbiome. So the microbiome is this invisible majority of the oceans made of viruses, bacteria, phytoplankton, microalgae, and uh, small animals. And um, we are going to introduce uh, new approaches to this uh, assessment and understanding and prediction of the microbiome status. So we are also going to focus on the microplastics and the distribution of microplastics and above all on the microbiome living on the microplastics because it uh, determines the toxicity and the fate of microplastics itself. Thirdly, we are going to, to see our currents spread around microbes and pollutants across all the Atlantic Ocean to have a better understanding of how to manage it. We are, uh, we are, we are going to have uh, four activity streams. One is to, in, um, to use existing data and, and having new data to assess the status and to map uh, the, the ecosystems and to provide these products for all the stakeholders. And at this end, we are going to have a very intense uh, sampling program from large scale cruises to uh, very coastal measurements with uh, all over, uh, all over the, the ocean from pole to pole. We're going to enhance knowledge by having new models for predictions, by providing using artificial intelligence to provide new tools for extracting knowledge from this huge amount of data. And we're also going to produce new sensors for automated monitoring of the ecosystem health. We are going to also to identify the drivers of change in the past and the future of those important elements of the ecosystem and uh, the, the ecosystem provisions. And also working together with social economist uh, specialists to really include all the different kinds of stressors and drivers. Finally, we are going to share capacity and transfer knowledge to stakeholders, but also all across uh, the, um, the team and the, the Atlantic. Uh, as an impact, I will present a very few case, uh, cases or let's say activities. One is uh, having an innovative literacy program to have ocean engaged citizens uh, together with UNESCO. 
We're going to have uh, an inclusive multidisciplinary training on new protocols for monitoring the status and the health of the microbiome, the ocean microbiome by introducing routinely genomics. And also we are going to have five case studies to bridge with applications. Case studies will bridge, for instance, to the production of new crops to in, uh, for, um, for uh, cultivation in case of salinification of soils due to the increase of sea level in the future, down to collaborate with the NGOs, with the other CC project on aquaculture, sustainability, but also on policies. Finally, I want to mention that we want to have a strong legacy, uh, not only in terms of a, a very a new huge data set that will be available for, uh, for the blue economy, but also to connecting infrastructure. Infrastructure to have really a long uh, legacy in the future after the project. And for doing that, we are, we are, we are organized in terms of a hub and nodes approach, which means uh, connecting infrastructure in Europe and notably EMBRC and sequencing centers together with the equivalent in Brazil and South Africa. And uh, we are already uh, organizing the share of um, uh, standardized uh, protocols. And we hope in the future to have nodes in the United States and Canada to really have a, a, a network that is going to be uh, to last in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much to you both for that presentation and sharing um, all of your plans with us. Um, I'm going to move right along. Um, I'm a bit out of time now, so I'm going to move right along to So Chic with uh, Jean Baptiste Salet and Sarah Nicholson. Perfect. Oops. Hi, Solil. Can you hear me? I can hear you. You were on presentation mode and it reverted back. Yeah, because I, I needed to switch my mic on. But that's now ah, done. Nice. So <clears throat> thank you. So I'm Jean-Baptiste Salé. I work in Sorbonne University in Paris, in France. And uh, I'm the scientific coordinator of uh, So Chic. Uh, which is a H2020 uh, project funded by the European Commission um, that gathers uh, 15 partners uh, spread across uh, Europe and South Africa. And, and today I've got the great pleasure to present in duo with uh, Sarah Nicholson. So I shall uh, take over uh, after uh, my overall introduction. Um, so SOSHIC stands for Southern Ocean Carbon and Heat Impact on Climate. So we've got really a, a regional focus on the Southern Ocean and in particular on the, on the Southern Atlantic uh, Basin. So really SOSHIC is, um, is, uh, uh, fits perfectly in uh, all Atlantic Research Alliance by being this, this basically the Southern end uh, of, of, this, uh, of this big Atlantic Basin. Um, so I, I'd like to uh, to give a, a brief overall introduction of on on why we why we should care uh, at all about uh, Southern Ocean and in particular the carbon heat of the Southern Ocean when we are interested in climate. So the reason why uh, we do care is that Southern Ocean and in particular the carbon and heat of the Southern Ocean are a huge climate regulator that are still poorly understood and represented in climate models. So do, just to give you some blunt uh, fact and numbers, Southern Ocean represents up to 50% of all the carbon dioxide and up to 75% of all the heat that is absorbed by the world oceans. So it's really a major pump for carbon and heat that pump it from the atmosphere to the ocean that we need to understand. For instance, if we are interested in, in some of, of, of the key policy relevant question, the basically question that relate greenhouse gas emission to atmospheric warming, that's a very a big question nowadays in the policy area. Uh, basically, uh, we, we wonder uh, how much greenhouse gas we can emit to reach an atmospheric warming of 1.5 or two degree. Uh, 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 in, in, in the context of the Paris Agreement. To address that question, we crucially need to understand where the sinks, and in particular, 
how much of this heat and carbon uh, is drained uh, by the cell nation. And so I know uh, on the ver uh, to Sarah, if she, if Sarah, you were wrong, to give a bit Hi. more details on, on the processes of the cell nation and, and, and what we do in Sashik. Um, could you go to the next slide, please, JB? Sure. So we're showing here a map of the surface temperature trend over the past 50 year years, <clears throat> where you have red regions that indicate uh, warming. And this map is really to um, bring home the point that JB mentioned about Southern Ocean heat uptake. So what you'll see is the pronounced contrast in the response of the ocean to atmospheric warming between the Southern Ocean and the rest of the global ocean, where you see this band of blue temperature loss, which is really due to this drainage of heat that JB was mentioning. Um, and this is due to the Southern Ocean's role in excess heat uptake as it's increasing. So while the drainage of heat that you see in this map seems to be regionally constrained to the Southern Ocean, it is indeed of global relevance. Next slide, please, JB. Next. Is, is it working? Can no. Oh yes, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, this is because the Southern Ocean forms a central part of the global ocean circulation. And as such changes that are occurring in the Southern Ocean have a far reaching impact. So the schematic um, that we're showing on the slide here, not only emphasizes the interconnectedness of the Southern Ocean, but it also highlights the centrality um, of the Southern Ocean and the global ocean circulation. It also highlights importantly, the vertical, uh, the, the vertical layers of the Southern Ocean. So you see the red uh, arrows here are the surface uh, currents and the blue are the deep ocean interior currents. Um, and it highlights the important role of the Southern Ocean for this vertical layering of the global circulation. So an estimated 65% of all of the deep, of the global deep ocean waters, which are being brought up to the surface uh, water in the Southern Ocean, are being exposed to the atmosphere for the first time. And these waters are then being modified by the atmosphere. Um, and there's an exchange, exchanges of um, heat and gases that are occurring in this region. And then they're being brought back down to uh, ocean depths where this modified water is um, remaining for uh, very long periods of time. And so changes that are occurring in the Southern Ocean really do have long-term uh, impacts on the globe. So it's really important to understand uh, this part of the ocean. Importantly, the Atlantic Ocean um, basin forms a key role in the global exchange that we see here. Um, impor it, the important aspect here is that it's linking these two polar systems together. Next slide, please. So the overall objective of SOCHIC is to really try and understand and quantify the variability of heat and carbon in the Southern Ocean. And in doing so, it hopes to contribute towards improved, um, improved estimates and improved constraints in global budgets of carbon and heat, and improved constraints or improved estimates of the um, future projections um, in CO2 and heat. So the SOCHIC project investigates these different processes, um, atmosphere, ocean, and sea ice, using a combination of different observational platforms and different numerical modeling approaches. Um, so some of these observational platforms, which you can see um, in on the slide, is things like aut aut autonomous uh, vehicles, such as gliders and sail drones. Um, and both the observations and numerical modeling are following a hierarchical approach. So it's really about setting up experiments to understand the processes um, and moving from beyond the processes to really understanding system scale changes um, and long, through long-term monitoring uh, observations and also through um, working towards earth system modeling. And then this is ready to try and understand how these processes impact, uh, how are they relevant for climate. So as South African partners, um, we have an important part uh, in this project, um, particularly but not exclusively through our involvement in uh, both the numerical modeling development and also strategic observational planning. But moreover, as we have a strong scientific knowledge base in the South Atlantic, we've been working in this region for quite some time. 
And this is where our proposed observations are going to be carried out. And so while there are many different aspects of the observations, the main crews that we are going to be having, which will be on the SA Gallus 2, which hopefully will be in taking place 2021-2022, uh, we'll have to see if COVID behaves, um, and that will be in the South Atlantic. Next slide, please. Yeah, so that's mostly a, um, about the, uh, it's, sorry, this is very sciencey, but if you'd like to find out more about the specific work packages in SoChic, um, please visit the website. And if you have any, um, th there's a lot of news updates on the Twitter feed. And yeah, thank you very much for your time and allowing this opportunity to present SoChic. Thank you. Thank you so much to you both, uh, Sarah and JB, for that uh, presentation on the amazing work that you guys are doing. Um, very fascinating uh, tools that you guys are using to monitor uh, as well. I think they're really cool. Uh, and then the last project that we're going to uh, hear from today is from Nicole Bibo uh, from the EU Polonet project. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Lila, for this introduction. Um, I will bring you now to the cold and icy areas of our planet and give you a short introduction. What EOPOLANET does and what we might uh, be able to do for the um, All Atlantic Ocean Research Alliance. Um, I will be fast since I am the last speaker today. So why are the poles important for the Atlantic Ocean? I think uh, if you see this figure on the right of the Atlantic Ocean, uh, of the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, it's self-explanatory. It shows that the Atlantic is strongly connected with the Arctic Ocean and also the Southern Ocean, as we nicely heard in the Sochik presentation just before my talk. Um, and I also added, to stress this even a bit more, um, a present on a figure from the um, IPCC special report on the ocean and cryosphere in a changing climate on this slide on the right hand side to show you the effects of the changing um, Atlantic meridional overturning circulation, the effects it would have on, on the land surrounding the Atlantic Ocean, on the poles, and also on the ocean itself. So a lot of changes would happen if, for example, this overturning circulation would weaken. And the poles, as I said before, are two of the key elements or the, are the are key elements influencing um, the circulation, but also the biodiversity and uh, so on in the, Arctic, in the Atlantic Ocean. And vice versa, the Arctic and also the Southern Ocean heavily depend on the Atlantic. Um, EOPOLANET, was it, was, what is EOPOLANET? EOPOLANET is a bit different than the projects you have heard before in this evening session. It's a coordination and support action. That means we are implemented um, to advise the European Commission and to support the European Commission in all issues related to the polar region. So we are not doing active research, but we are doing research planning. Um, your Polarnet has just, your Polarnet 2, which I'm speaking about now, has just started two months ago, but we have already a five years history with your Polarnet 1. And um, I will show you in a minute some of our highlights from EU Polarnet 1, <clears throat> which might be interesting for you also to work, um, which might make you interested to work with us. So EUPOLANET is now the largest consortium of expertise and infrastructure in polar research. It consists of 25 partners and includes all European uh, states, member states and associated countries which, have, which run large polar programs or sufficient polar programs. In addition, some important polar international organizations are also members of the consortium, like for example, the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program, the International Center for Reindeer Husbandry, the World Ocean Council, and uh, as our main partner, the European Polar Board. That means also that we can connect 
the uh, members of the All Atlantic Re uh, Ocean Research Alliance with all European uh, polar partners in uh, uh, with all European partners in polar research. Our ambition in the new project is that we would like to establish a sustainable and inclusive platform <clears throat> to co-develop and advance European polar research actions. So we will do significant polar research planning. And we will use this also to give evidence-based advice to policy-making processes. We did this successfully in the last five years, and we will even strengthen this in the future. And our major goal is that we would like to sustain the network and the platform then later on in a European Polar Coordination Office, which will continue to work after the project funding has ended. So to give you, I heard today, let's say it like this, several times the word co-designing and this is exactly what we have done in the last five years and what we will do in the four upcoming years so and our major approach uh, uh, our major output from the first five years of the project was the integrated european polar research program which was in fact co-designed from the beginning on with all the stakeholders which are relevant for the polar regions and how did we do this? So we started with getting a baseline overview of what the uh, nations who do polar research in the Arctic and in the Antarctic are interested in. And we went through 154 polar strategies, not only from European partners, but from all over the world. We distilled the most important um, topics and then we went into a five-year stakeholder dialogue so we had online consultations and up to 52 meetings with stakeholders to find out what are really their needs uh, when it comes to polar research and uh, we clustered these in this very complicated uh, um, figure here on the right hand side and we ended up with six overarching research priorities. And based on that, we together with our stakeholders wrote an integrated European polar research program, which is just published and available on our website. This polar research program, of course, includes also a lot of ocean research recommendations. We also uh, worked heavily on infrastructure. So polar research is really difficult from a logistic point of view and very expensive. So our attempt has to be really to join forces when it comes to operation and also to infrastructures. And just as a side note, the vessel which is here on the figure, the Polarstern is a frequent guest in Cape Town. And I guess some of you have very often seen it because Cape Town is the logistic hub for Polarstern when it goes to the Southern hemisphere, uh, to the Antarctic. We compiled all our information of all European infrastructures and in both poles, so ships, camps, laboratories, shelters, vessels, uh, stations, aircraft, in an European polar infrastructure catalog, and developed also a data bank which is continuously updated. And uh, this data bank is hosted by our major partner, the European Polar Board. You can access this, and when you want to work uh, in the polar areas or in the polar oceans, you can see which vessels are working there or which stations are accessible. And finally, at, uh, also a couple of months ago, we came out with a white paper on European polar infrastructure access and interoperability, which provides recommendation how to prove, improve the access to the uh, polar um, infrastructures, but also to its interoperability. <laughs> And it, it includes also an implementation plan for the polar research program. And finally, uh, EU Polarnet is also um, coordinating the EU Polar Cluster. And so Chic, which, which just presented beforehand, is one of the members of the EU Polar Cluster. This is a cluster of 21 European funded polar projects. And um, we have joined our forces in many areas, like, for example, stakeholder engagement or joint policy advice or joint communication. And I put this slide up also to show you that um, you can engage with all of these projects via contacting us. And um, uh, we would be very, very happy if, uh, if we can make connection to those who are relevant to your work, which you want to perform. 
Um, so thank you very much for your attendance and looking forward to future cooperation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nicole, for sharing with us all that amazing work that you're doing, that you will do um, towards bridging the gap of, or bridging the gap that is socioeconomic development, um, particularly contributing to it using the ocean and the research and innovation from the ocean. Thank you so much uh, for that contribution. We have come to the end of a very insightful um, day of conversation that I have thoroughly enjoyed. I've enjoyed spending my time with you and, and hope that you have enjoyed yourselves too. I have learned today a great deal and hope you too have learned a great deal. And of course, I'm really inspired I'm really inspired hearing about the multidisciplinarity approach, the uh, inclusion of communities and the inclusion of people and human capital development to ensure that nobody is left behind in the impact and the contributions that can be made from the data that is generated out of the research and the innovation or innovative outputs of the All Atlantic Ocean um, Research Forum and Alliance. Thank you so much to all of the speakers. Uh, you guys were delightful. Your presentations were beautiful. And people in, um, on our social media platforms that are streaming live via Facebook and those that are streaming via YouTube, thank you for staying with us. It's been a long day. To the 227 participants that are still here on Zoom, thank you very much for joining us. And we see you again tomorrow. But before we leave, I think the, um, there is a there is a uh, an announcement that I'd like to make about the first international symposium uh, in human health and the ocean in a changing world that is currently going on and started actually seven minutes ago um, and there's the um, advert uh, or the flyer for it on your screen now and the link. To it as well as going to be, oh, they've just put it into the, the, the chat now. Thank you, Laura. So if you would like to encourage you to join that conversation. And uh, with that, from my side, I see you tomorrow at the same time. Uh, Tudile Kanyile is signing out all the way from Johannesburg, South Africa. Thank you so much. You've been a great audience. Goodbye. <laughs>